Uh, Heavenly Father, um, this morning as we uh, turn our attention to those uh, first events of the first Easter, we pray that we would see Jesus as you want us to see him. Give us a fresh understanding of who he is and why it is that we ought to worship him. Amen. So as I just prayed, we're starting our Easter uh, series this morning. And we're thinking about the, the, the events of, of the, the, the first Easter. And as, as we do, I simply want to uh, ask this morning, this Easter, uh, have we got a right view of Jesus? Have we got a right view of uh, Jesus? Because how we view somebody, uh, what we know of them, changes how we relate to them, right? Uh, and this morning, and across this Easter, then I want to suggest to us that exactly the same is true when we come to the person of Jesus, that how we view him, what we understand of him will affect how we relate to him. So if we think he's just a nice bloke, we might respect him, but we probably won't want to follow him. If we think he's a figment of the Bible writer's imagination, then we might entertain the stories of him as as good fiction, but we'll pay no attention to him. If we think he's a good role model, we might moralize with him, but we'll reject his grace. If we think he's a savior, but not king, we might like him, but not live our lives for him. If we think he's king, but not savior, then we might become incredibly religious for him, but have no assurance of eternity with him. But if we think he's the royal son of God, through whom all things are created, sustained, and can be redeemed, then most surely we're going to run to him with praise and thanksgiving. Uh, so over this Easter service, starting here in uh, this Easter series, starting here in Luke 19 and that reading that we just had a moment ago, I want us to be asking, have we got Jesus' identity right? So if you have closed your Bibles, do open them up again to Luke chapter 19. As we begin to this morning to consider who the Jesus of Easter really is. And the first thing that we need to see this morning is that Jesus declares himself to be the king over all circumstance. The king over all circumstance. Is it working, Regin? Hang on. I'm being translated into Farsi as I speak, and so we're just checking it's working. Have I a problem? (laughs) Do I interfere? Okay, you sit there. That's fine. Uh, Jesus declares himself to be the king over all circumstances circumstance. So so look at verse 29. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anybody asks you why you are untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, went, sent, went away, sorry, and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Don't you just wish you had that kind of knowledge? Imagine just in the last week, if you could have had that same sort of insight into circumstances Jesus does here. I mean, those of you with mortgages, just, just consider this. Can you imagine how good it would be now if you had Jesus' insight? You'd have no worries about rising interest rates and working out whether to fix your mortgage or not. Instead, you'd have been able to confidently sit back having refixed a couple of years ago when rates were low. How good would it be to have knowledge like this? You see, when you think about what Jesus does here, it's really astounding, isn't it? Because just look again at those verses. As Jesus directs his disciples' actions, so he knows, verse 30, that just at the entrance to the village, tied up, there will not be just any old donkey, but a colt, a baby donkey that no one has ever ridden. He knows that somebody is going to ask the disciples, why are you untying the donkey? And he knows that they will happily let the disciples take the donkey after they've announced it's for the Lord. Which, by the way, isn't as weird as it sounds, because in Jesus' day, donkeys were like the the rideshare scheme of the day. Somebody respected in the community asked to borrow a donkey. It was unusual uh, to refuse. Don't know how they got it back. Don't know. Did they just plug it into one of those things and somebody came with a van later on and picked it up and took I have no idea. Anyway, now some people would say here that, that Jesus has prearranged the circumstances. 
so that the cult would be available when the disciples turned up. And, and that, that may be true, but it seems to me that Luke, the writer, intends us actually to understand this as extraordinary. I think Luke's emphasis on the disciples going ahead to the village in verse 29 and 30 is there to show us that Jesus hadn't been there yet. He's not had some sneaky peek earlier in the week and made the arrangements for borrowing the donkey. And coupled with that is the fact that if Jesus had made arrangements to borrow the colt, why would its owners question the disciples and tie in the colt? They'd be like, oh yeah, they've, they've come along. We, we understand why he's taking it. No, Luke wants us to understand, to know that Jesus' control of the circumstances here is supernatural. Which, as a Christian, we shouldn't really have any problem believing. After all, the whole centerpiece of our faith is that next week we're celebrating Easter when Jesus rose from the dead to new life. So if he can do that, then he should have, we should have no problem thinking he knows where a cult might be tied up. But either way, whether it's prearranged or not, it doesn't really matter because... What this little episode tells us is that as Jesus heads into Jerusalem towards his arrest, his trial, and his execution, towards all that is coming, he is in absolute total control of the circumstances. He really is the Lord. He is the Lord of everything, even down to the minutiae of detail. You see, lots of people would say on that first Good Friday, well, Jesus, he was just an unfortunate victim. Victim of circumstance, wrong place, wrong time. Or a victim of his own success, causing others to rise up against him in jealousy. Oh, he was a victim of getting sucked into the euphoria of it all and ended up finding out that he was on a road that he just couldn't get off. A road that led to his certain death. But here Jesus is saying to us, through his control of the circumstances, as I head into Jerusalem, I am doing it on my terms and in my way. As I head to my death, I am the Lord over all that is going on. I am in total control. I am king of the circumstances. And so next Friday... As we gather together and remember Jesus' trial and crucifixion, you'll see that that control continues as Jesus is tried, as he's sentenced, as he's killed on his terms and his alone. The marvellous fact is that Jesus' arrest, trial and crucifixion are as intentional as riding into town on a donkey. So resolute is he in saving you. Jesus, as he sends his disciples on ahead, is making a huge statement about himself here. I am king over the circumstances. I'm in control. Nothing happens by chance. If you think I'm a hapless victim, think again. I know exactly what I'm doing. Uh, I'm here to die. I have come that you might have life and life to the full. Jesus came, lived and died with the express purpose of your salvation. Which ought, to, which ought to cause you to delight in the love of God and your worth to God. As you consider this holy week, the deliberate length that he would go to save you and me. And Jesus says, even in my death, I am king, Lord, over the circumstances. But then if you're Lord over the circumstances, that raises another question in our minds, doesn't it? Well, it does in mine anyway. Maybe it's just the way I think and you can... Just disregard me saying that if, if you need to. Because, well, I don't know about you, but if, if I was about to start out on a journey and I was in control of, of all the circumstances and I was about to ride as king into my people's principal city, a city that had been under siege by an unwelcome Roman, Roman occupying force, a city of so much royal history. And it was kind of as in control of the circumstances and I knew it was the Passover festival, a time in my people's religious calendar which meant that anyone who was anyone in the Jewish world would be present. Well, if I was king of the circumstances and I could stage manage and organise any detail that I wanted, well, I'm not sure I'd arrive in the back of a Skoda Fabia, would you? No, I'd want the Bentley. Or the Rolls Royce. 
Perhaps in the city's political climate, I might actually borrow a tank or one of those Land Rovers, you know, with the massive guns on the back. But Jesus, the king of circumstance, the one who's in control of, of everything, even down to the minutiae, the one who's in control of the details, chooses the Skoda Fabia of his day. Sorry if you drive a Skoda Fabia, by the way. A Skoda Fabia, I'm not really having a go. <laughs> Although this may sound like I am. The understated, slow, sure-footed, humble back of a baby donkey. Which means when I read this, I think of childhood holidays to Blackpool not uh, Beach, not kingly rule. Not, not glory and not honour. So what on earth is going on? Again, it would be very easy to get Jesus' identity wrong here as a, as a bit of a wishy-washy soft king, right? Well, if you don't mind, flip, flip back with me to the book of Zechariah and chapter 9. I haven't got a page number. I meant to get a page number. If you need to use the index at the front of your Bible, go for it. And then when somebody gets to Zechariah chapter 9, shout out a page number. 796, we have a winner, bingo. 796 in the Blue Bibles. Uh, and look at this, as, as we see this, are you all sort of there, Zechariah chapter 9. We see here that Jesus, in riding into Jerusalem on donkey, is declaring himself not only the king of circumstance, but the king of promise as well. You see, God's people have been waiting for a king to come and rescue them for a really long time. Because in their history, hundreds of years before Jesus, they had a, a period when they refused to worship God or listen to him. And so God was like, well, fine, if you, if you don't want me, have it your way. And he gave them over to their own ways and means. He left them to it, which meant that when a, a mighty army of Babylon came along, and then the mighty army of Assyria came along, and then the mighty army of Rome came upon Jerusalem, the principal city of the Jews. Well, with no protection from the mighty hand of God, time after time after time, Jerusalem was sacked and her people were forced to live as captives of occupying forces. They'd become prisoners in their own city, and they had a broken relationship with their God. But because God is faithful to his people and a merciful and gracious and kind God, and because he has made them promises in the past to give them a land and grow them as a nation and to bless them and to be their God, well, then he sent some messengers, some prophets to his people like Zechariah. And through them, he told his people that one day he was going to return and he was going to rescue them, that he would send them a king who would bring peace and freedom to his people and once again restore them to being the people that God had promised they would be. And these verses from Zechariah 9, reading from verse 9, are part of one of those promises. Written around 500 years before Jesus, just look what God says through Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a water donkey. The colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Do you see how Zechariah tells us God's royal agent of peace is going to arrive on the scene? Not on a war horse. Not in a fanfare of the spectacular, but on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. Which means back to Luke, to the Jewish nation who had been awaited this king for over 500 years. Now sitting under Roman occupied rule, Jesus is declaring something massive about himself. By getting on this baby donkey, Jesus is saying, I am that king. The one promised by and sent by God to bring you peace, to restore your fortunes, to bring freedom to those who will follow me. But what's more, this peace isn't just for those of Jewish descent. No, did you notice in Zechariah, this peace is to be proclaimed to the nations, to all people from sea to sea, to the whole world. And Jesus' claim back in Luke to be this king is not unmissed by the people around him as he gets on that donkey. 
which, by the way, wasn't a small crowd. Historians tell us that at Passover, Jerusalem was bulging at the seams. There would have been a, a big crowd of people here. Uh, picture the crowds that we imagine will be at King Charles's coronation in a few months' time. And here they all recognize with glee what Jesus is claiming because they make his, his journey as regal as possible, don't they? Back in Luke, verse 35, they made Jesus a saddle out of their coats. Verse 36, they laid their equivalent of a red carpet down for him by spreading their cloaks down in front of him. And then look what the people cried out, verse 38. Blessed is the king who came, it comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Oh, Jesus' travel arrangements here, they haven't gone unnoticed. No, the people understand totally what Jesus is saying here. He is the king of God's promise who has come also as the king of peace. He's the one who will free his kingly subjects from captivity. But in great joy too, the people also recognize that Jesus has come as the king who would bring peace between God and man. Because do you remember, Israel had been rebels. Those who, not unlike us, had lived most of their lives as if God didn't exist and so had made themselves enemies of God rather than his friends. Remember, he just left them to it. That's why they're in captivity in the first place. So they found themselves living outside of God's blessing and under Roman rule, surviving, but definitely not thriving. Which is why here they are so excited that this king has arrived. They wanted life back. They wanted freedom from all that weighed them down, from the baggage of their life as captives of Rome. They wanted to be God's people in relationship with God again, to experience the freedom and blessing of what that meant. Which is like why those who recognize that Jesus, what Jesus is saying about himself here cried out in verse 38. Look at it again. Peace. Peace. Where? In heaven. And glory in the highest. Because they see that this Jesus is their peacemaker with God himself. Peace in heaven. As they see the king approaching the city of God on the back of a colt, and as they consider, verse 37, the miracles that Jesus has been doing throughout his ministry, they realize that he is the one. This is him. This is the long-awaited king, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who as God's anointed would and could represent and restore his people in the sight of God. The one who could and would bring upon his subject spiritual renewal, who would bring the creator God's favor back to those who bow the knee to this king. This is him. This is the one. He's here at last. Peace in heaven. We can be friends with God once again. We can be restored as a people. We can have our identity and our life back. Here he is. Freedom, redemption, rescue, peace. This is what Jesus came to give. Oh, yes, to this worshipping crowd, but also to you and me. He offers those of us who have so often lived in rebellion to God, peace with God, that we might know the blessings and the freedom and the rescue of God. Now, it's clear as the, the story goes on, and as we'll see on Good Friday, that those here who are singing Jesus' praises don't yet understand how Jesus will bring peace. And they're not expecting here what Jesus already knows, that his kingly role is to die for his subjects in order to appease a just God for human rebellion. The punishment of death has to be served. They haven't understood that the king who represents the people will be the one to die in the place of the people. No, they're still expecting a warrior king, even if he is on a donkey. But Jesus knows. He's king of the circumstances. He is in total control and has come to bring peace between God and man by heading towards a Roman cross to lay down his life for his subjects as the king of circumstance, the king of promise, and the king of peace. What a king. A king who would die for his people. Now, of course, gloriously, we go beyond Good Friday to Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday, he tells us that this king, this king didn't stay dead. No, we know from the empty tomb that this king is even king over death itself. That he now reigns from heaven as the king of the universe. 
And so the question is, now we've understood more of this king, how are we going to respond to this king this Easter time? You see, as we said at the beginning, what we know of somebody will affect how we relate to them. And I don't know who you thought Jesus is before you came here this morning. Perhaps you've never even really thought about it. Perhaps you've thought of him as some nice bloke from history, but irrelevant for today. Perhaps you thought of him as a good teacher, a good role model for the kids. A fairy tale? A crutch for weak people? Or maybe you're somebody who knows Jesus as the peacemaker, the one who brings us back into friendship with God through dying on a cross, but never really had thought of him as being a king before. Who do you think Jesus is? Even those of you who've been around Christian things for any length of time, who do you think Jesus is? Have you, have you got him right? As God's anointed king who will willingly die for his subjects because that's who he claims to be. And if that's true, then we need to relate to him as that king, don't we? You see, a proper response to the king is like the response of those in the passage who would willingly give them their cult, like those who would pull out the red carpet for him and treat him with honour and respect, like those who would see who he is and praise him and worship him and bow the knee to him and hail him as God's king, living under his rule and his ways in his kingdom. And there are many of us here this morning who would do that, who've looked into the evidence of Jesus, who've checked out his claims to be the king of the universe, have enthroned him as the king of their life. And I want to say, if that's you here today, Remembering Jesus as king, how are you getting on with living your life with Jesus as the king of your life? If you know he's king, how are you getting on as submitting to him as king? How overflowing with joy are you that Jesus has come as the peacemaker between you and God? Might you this Easter need to relearn the lesson from these disciples on the road to Jerusalem here who willingly throw their coats before the king in worship, who sing loudly and without shame their praises to God for the king of salvation has come. How delighted are you that God's king rules? And where do you need to start living with Jesus king over every area of life again? But then there may be others here this morning who will never have thought about Jesus as God's king before, and today has put some questions in your mind. Like, is this real? Is, is Jesus really who he claims to be? Can he really be the risen king of the whole world, king of circumstance, king of promise, king of peace, who can restore me to the person I was created to be in friendship with God? Or if that's you today, don't, don't leave here and let life take over again so that you never think of Jesus again. Now start checking out Jesus' claims. Why not this Easter pick up a Bible? If you've not got one, let me know. I'll sort you out with one. We've got some here that we'd love to give you. Start reading this account of Jesus' life. Read the book of Luke. Read it through and ask, is this Jesus who Jesus says he is? Can this Jesus really bring me into friendship with God? Did he really die for my rebellion? Is he really the peacemaking king? Let me invite you, come along to our other Easter services. Next Friday, Easter Sunday, explore who Jesus is. Ask yourself, do I need to start relating to him differently? Do I need to change my opinion of him and turn to live with him as king? And if as you do that, you start to realize that you do, then please start to live a new life with Jesus as king. Change the way that you relate to him. And then still others of you actually may well find yourself in the camp of the Pharisees in this passage. Verse 39, the religious elite. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, don't let them blaspheme this way. Tell them not to be so silly as to worship you as the Messiah, the Christ, the long-awaited king. Come on, Jesus, tell them. How dare they? 
See, they didn't see Jesus as king. They didn't want Jesus as king. He didn't fulfill their expectations of what God's king would be like. They didn't like what he was claiming. And so they rejected Jesus' claims outright. Can't possibly be true. Teacher, rebuke your disciples for even claiming this blasphemy. But look how Jesus responds to those who reject him outright. We, we didn't have it read, but verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, that's Jerusalem, he wept over it. Saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the thing that makes for peace. Jesus is bitterly upset that those who should have welcomed him with open arms, the city of God's people, the city of the religious elite, the city where God's temple stood proud, the city where God had promised his king would journey to on the back of a cult would be the city that rejects him and so misses out. And instead faces verse 43, destruction, as God says, enough is enough. I have sent my peacemaker and you have rejected him and so now your hope is gone. And incidentally, in AD 70, Jerusalem was sacked by Rome and everything in verses 43 and 44 happened. He's saying amid tears. Please understand that this isn't Jesus going, ha ha, you've missed out. This is amid tears, amid weeping. To these folk who have been waiting for their rescuer for hundreds of years, for a hope beyond this life, for friendship with God and a life to the full. You're waiting for your Messiah. You're desperate for life. You're desperate for hope. You're desperate for eternity. You're desperate to be the people of God, the people of promise, the people of eternity. Yet as you reject me, you're rejecting everything that you long for. And you're looking for hope in the wrong place. And I wonder if some of us might be in the same boat this morning. Have you ever wondered, is this it? Is this life 80 years of slog, work, worry, crime, and penny pinching? Is this what I'm here for? Is this as good as it gets? Where is my hope? What's life uh, uh, about? And we chase after it in all sorts of ways, don't we? Whether, whether religion or stuff or, or work or money or identity and status. But Jesus here says, no, 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 I'm it. I'm the one whom God has promised and who can bring you peace with God and restore you to the person you were created to be in relationship with him. I can offer you life now, teaching you what you're made for, and I can offer you eternity into the future. Peace with me. I am the king of circumstance. I am the king of promise. I am the king of peace. Don't reject me so easily. Stop looking elsewhere. Come see me. If only you would know that I have come to restore you to relationship with God, to life, to eternity, to save you from destruction because that's what ultimately rejection of me will lead to don't write me off says Jesus as tears run down his cheeks and so if you're someone here today who has written Jesus off or has just moved from him and gone well I'm not sure he can offer me what he promises and so I'm going to go and chase it after it somewhere else and can I encourage you to look again Jesus claims that writing him off is to write off all hope. It is to write off friendship with God. It is to write off ever being who you were made to be. It is to write off eternity. Are you really ready to make that decision? So instead of writing off Jesus before you've got to know him, why not get to know him first? Become an interested inquirer. Examine the evidence. Take that offer of the Bible if you haven't got one. Come again to church. Ask yourself again, can I be guilty of putting on Jesus a mistaken identity? I need to change how I relate to him. And that's true for all of us, isn't it? We need to be constantly asking, have I got Jesus right? Is the Jesus I know, follow, worship, ignore or reject the real Jesus? Or could it be that I've got him wrong and need to respond differently? It's how I view Jesus right so that I'm relating to him rightly. And my prayer at this Easter for us all is that we'll delight in King Jesus, the one who died to save you and me. Let's pray.
Just take a moment of quiet to reflect yourselves. Touch on something you've heard this morning. How is it you view Jesus? Lord God, we praise you that King Jesus, the King over all circumstance, that despite being in sovereign control of the whole universe, orchestrated things that would lead to his death on our behalf. We praise you that he was willing to ride that donkey towards the city of rejection where he would die for us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that he died, that he would bring peace. We thank you that as you promised in the past, there would be a king who would come to lead your people in your ways. Help us to be a people who delight in his peace and to follow King Jesus through this life and into the next. By your word and your Holy Spirit over this Easter, we pray that you would open our eyes to see the majesty, the glory, the wonder that is King Jesus, that we might be a people who follow him and who worship him and who delight in him. Amen.